Yo dog, Kenny Boucher here, Next Level Painting, hitting you up on the lit your best of all days, coming to you from the Beats Lab in Hollywood, California, we're doing it again. Today we're going to be talking about the Next Level Painting 101 curriculum. This is a system I've developed over the course of 10 years. Look, I didn't invent the wheel or even reinvent the wheel. There's lots of things you've seen here before. I have put them in an order and a sequence that made things easy for me while I was commissioned painting as a solo act for years. Most people who believe in a system that they preach believe in it because they believe it is the best. I do believe this system is the best. This will help you get your models to that table very fast. We are going to cut tons of corners, but the trick is to make it look like we didn't cut any corners. Let's do this thing, guys. I've got Spell Crow Plague Knights for days. These are totally not Plague Marines, and I'm showing you the end of the video at the beginning of the video because I'm a marketing genius. I have the Perfect Rack, which is a model holder system, which I'll get into later. Real quick, it is for sale, and it's also very limited. I'm not a retailer, guys. We're going to lay out some sticky tack, put our duders on the stadium seating. It's going to make the whole process easier. But look, we got to rattle can these guys real quick for the 101 curriculum. You can just put them on some cardboard, put them in a box lid, it doesn't matter. What I'm gonna do is take these guys to the garage, I'm gonna use the Army Painter Black Primer, couple of thin passes. I don't go too hard here, but I am choosing black as my primer because it does conceal coverage in the shadows as we start into the next steps of the 101 painting curriculum. Let it dry for a few hours, maybe put it in front of a fan, maybe sleep on it, wake up in the morning, and then you can start the actual first step of the curriculum. Spoiler alert, we're gonna start with the airbrush. Look, the Next Level Painting 101 curriculum is airbrushing, washing, edge highlighting. We're gonna go on that journey here today. Look guys, airbrushing is secretly easy. I've got dozens of videos on the tubes about this. What I'm here to talk to you guys about today is how I'm gonna select my colors. So I'm gonna pick up very bright hue, which is bright yellow green. Shout out to Pearl Krill from Monument Hobbies. I'm gonna pick, you know, reasonably two values. Black, brown, light, warm, gray. I'm gonna spin up the wax like a DJ, manipulate the opacity of the hue, and introduce those values. What I'm doing is filling up the airbrush with a little Vallejo Flow Improver, throwing a little bit of that brown black in there, stirring it up. We're gonna deploy a nice black, brown, all over this black primer. Now I'm gonna take a step back from the model, create a big cone of influence, and just try to get nice, even coats. I am kind of playing from the top down position, that zenithal position, but I'm pretty much going for max coverage here. Anything I can't reach with the airbrush, the black spray paint will hide it. That's why I chose black. If we went with any other color, it would have made it trickier. Advantage with the perfect rack is you can kind of get a lot of this done without even taking them off the rack but you can pull those stems off and put them in your model holder pretty simple stuff if you don't have a perfect rack the meaningless there's not, nothing that you can't do normally in your beats lab that would make this easy this is just a very convenient tool that i love having so we're doing the black brown this is our darkest value in the workup now let's talk about hues for a second obviously when you think death guard nurgle you think green we are going to be using a bright yellow green but we're going to be using it in somewhat of a different way all a hue like green can do is be itself the only power you have over it is adjusting the opacity manipulating the transparency so by taking these colors and putting them together what we're saying is we're going to darken up that green by introducing it to the dark brown and we're going to thin it down with a little water a little flow improving the airbrush what's going to manipulate the opacity okay so this bright yellow green is being heavily informed and desaturated by our black brown now like that's all advanced bullshit you don't need to even really think about that when you pull your airbrush out typically it's pick a bright color pick a mid-tone pick a shadow just work your way up from dark to bright no big deal now this is the first step Okay, we're coming from the top down. There's not a thought position. We're trying to stay extreme. Opening up the cone, we're letting that new mix kind of hit everything up top. We're letting like the details kind of block it by controlling our angles. And what's that? what that's going to do is cast shadows just below those shelves, keeping it a little bit more in that black brown range. Now, when I airbrush, what I like to do is marry my colors. The next level painting 101 airbrushing system is about color combining. If we're going to have black brown, there's always going to be some of that green in it. If we're going to go up to that light warm gray, we got to hit with green first. So on our path to each color, we got to marry them together. So we know we want to end up with a little bit 
of this bright yellow green at some point in its own fashion, like in its own unfucked with state. So color marrying is a big part of the system. It helps you create really flawless transitions. Well, Death Guard might not be the greatest example of flawless transitions because I'm trying to create an exciting paint job while also honoring the lore, a little bit of that narrative. And here we go. I'm going to keep these two identical Marines at different stages of completion throughout the project so you can kind of see where we're going and where we want to go in the future. Now here is a little bit more of that bright yellow green. So we're going to really green up the mix, okay? But I realize it's not bright enough because that green isn't necessarily that much brighter in value than what we've already gotten there. It's just manipulating the hue. It's flipping the vibrancy. So by adding a drop of that light warm gray to the mix, I've really sent it up to the top. Now, like I said, none of this really matters. You could literally just go dark, mid, light and get fantastic results. I'm just trying to expand upon my thought process here. We're creating a brighter value. And again, all that beautiful hue can do is kind of mess with it on an opaque or transparent level. So I added a little bit more water to the pot to thin it down. When I see any kind of speckling coming from my airbrush, typically all I gotta do is thin it down. I'm aiming at different parts of the model. I'm stepping up now. I'm not nearly as far away. I'm trying to create some exciting transitions, maybe at the bottom of the shoulders, tops of the heads, tops of the shoulder pads, uh, kneecaps, whatever, tops of hands. But you know what, for rank and file, you got to create a sustainable paint job. The 101 curriculum is the best curriculum in the game today. There's a simple reason for that. I developed this in the trenches of pro painting as a single man studio, and I developed it in order to pay my bills. So it took a decade to get to where I am with it today, but you can learn it in like literally three hours. So what we did was we added a shit load more of that light warm gray to the pot. We're really gonna step up in value here. Now, anytime you go like white or black into a hue, you really do desaturate. It takes away some, it steals some of the, the vibrancy. That's okay, you can always restore it later, but I'm actually kind of looking for that here. Now we're gonna upgrade yet again with the Zenithal position, staying extreme, letting those shadows form under all those shelves, those details. And you see, this is heavily, right? Heavily influenced by that green, but it's, you're starting to, kind of like not see it anymore right but it's there i promise you but i'm really kind of playing around with that pre-heresy vibe i really want to get that desaturation i'm going to get a little bit more interesting but green will be a big part of this paint job here it is you can see a lot of detail a lot of shadows are there feeling good about this that is a sustainable transition now let's blast all these dudes super quick get to that sustainability because we got 10 guys to paint using this system you can get 10 guys done in five days while just chilling and watching netflix not even a thing guys so there they are they look real good they're set up i'm feeling them here's our two identical guys that we're holding back for the 102 system okay so we we want to go maybe a touch brighter Okay, so what I did was I dumped the pot, left a little of the dirty paint water behind, added a little bit more light gray to it, and I'm gonna thin the pot down, okay? Now, I don't know what airbrush you guys use. I am really enjoying the Mr. Hobby Creos. It's got a regulator on it. It got you kind of throttle the PSI. It's all good though. You can get one of those from Spray Gunner. So what I'm doing now is just reinforcing those values and really popping it. Taking my time. I'm painting with practically water. It looks very white, very gray, but there's still tons of that green there and you'll see what happens. Now, this is a test model. We painted this on Twitch. You always wanna do a test model. Now, whoa, that's real different. How did we get there, you know? There's a lot that happened to get to this stage. And what we're doing now is showing you how we got there. I'm using dark silver. I'm using copper. I'm gonna use some bronze. I'm gonna use a little bit of white gold, maybe even light bronze. These are all pro krill. This is Monument Hobbies. After you do all those awesome airbrush effects, sometimes you gotta block in the details before you wash. Sometimes you're gonna wash then block in the details. I'm not really gonna cover blocking in the details on a, like a really detailed level here. Just know that there is a sweet spot where one coat does get it done, okay? You can find it, play with it. Just know that if you're gonna err, err on the soft side, err on the, okay, it takes two thin coats. But well, many times I'm able to get the paint exactly opaque enough and thin enough that I get one and done it. Only you can play with it, you can figure it out. There's lots of tools in the game that make it easier, different brands of paints. 
wet palettes, good brushes. Look, I have a product list in this description box below. We have entered the lay down phase. Now this is a given. You can't do any paint job without this step. Now, so it kind of exists outside of our three piece workup, but I'm gonna try to walk you through and give you a couple tips and tricks. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is my decision in these colors. There's a, there's a color called Deathless Metal. That's a Privateer Press P3 paint. I love it. I love those guys too, but for this project, we are using Manya Mojave's Pro Krill. And so what I've done is I've kind of just looked at metal and realized that metal paints, which I love, are just colors with glitter in them. So by choosing basically dark silver, copper, and bronze, I'm saying like, I want like a dark gray, a brown, and a little bit of an ochre in there. And what that does is create like a desaturated brownish yellow. That's it. So we're gonna lay it all in, we're gonna block it in. We're doing the grindiest part of all paint jobs. Putting our headphones on, kicking it back with an audio book and making it happen. Okay, this is the hot garbage phase. What I do is I like to say, okay, it's time to do all the metal. So I do them on all 10 guys. Then I stop, I take a break. Then maybe I do the next, the purples, the pinks, whatever. I try to work them all together in an assembly line, I try to keep my numbers sustainable. It's all about sustainability with the 101 system. Now, when it comes to laying paint down, I like a big brush. I'm using the number four. This is an igniter, Monument Hobbies. And it's big and fat, holds a lot of moisture, which means I can get a lot of time on the model between reloads, right? Has a really skinny tip, so I can still catch the details, but I can just keep going, cranking it out. The other thing was that I wanna talk about with you guys, brush pressure. I use that phrase a lot on my live show. I want you to imagine that you are like a paint guide who can control gravity around you in your workspace. I want you to be able to make your paintbrush weightless. When you flex the bristles by pressing too hard, that, that needs to be a conscious decision you, to, to do some, you know, to reach some area you can't reach, right? Whatever. Because really what you're trying to do is transfer the paint from the paintbrush to the model. The lighter the brush pressure, the more paint you got on the brush, the wetter it is, the easier that is. You just can kind of lay it down, then manipulate it, move it around, and make it work. I can usually get one and done coverage. Two thin coats, you know, obviously I air on that side as I mentioned, but like all this metal, I'm doing it in one pass. It's very wet. It's not necessarily that transparent. It's still semi-opaque, but it's wet enough that I can move quick and it's opaque enough that it'll be fine because I know later I'm gonna throw washes down and maybe do a little bit of edge highlighting. So it's gonna be all good. So I'm trying to create sustainable paint jobs by removing as many steps as possible. To, you know, imagine painting all this trim twice. Fuck that. <laughs> that ain't my life. Who's got time for that? All right, so we're gonna push through. We're gonna get this nice new mix down on every bolter and then we're already planning the next color. Now, our test model shows a lot of pinks and purples, that old school Yo Dog pattern, Death Guard Marine. So we're gonna be picking out our colors. We're thinking about how we wanna lay them down. As we're inspecting all the models, as we paint them all, we're kind of like picking out areas that are gonna be focal points so we can make informed decisions as we move on to the project. I might take a break and then come back to it, review our test model, and really just point out the areas that are focal points and how much extra love we put into them and then move from there. So we're gonna start in on the purples, okay, the pinks. I'm gonna be using dark purple and magenta. One of these is obviously a little brighter than the other, but they also give us two very vibrant hues. Whenever you're playing with purple, I always like to pick some really exciting versions of the same purple. And when I really wanna brighten the purple, what I do is add either like ivory to it or light warm gray. So just like with the airbrush, we're gonna start dark. We're gonna block in all the things I want purple right now. Dark base coat. And I'm gonna do this across the entire army. Now, for the most of the detail work in this video, I'm focusing on this guy, but I'm doing all these guys right now, trying to make this video really just hit it all. Like, I don't, I want, I don't wanna use as much movie magic as I usually do, I just wanna get these 10 guys done for you. So now what we're gonna do, just like at any point in the next level painting system, is we're gonna marry our colors, we're gonna uh, swirl a little bit of that magenta in to our dark purple, go in there, create some quick highlights, and then maybe even just uh, throw a little brown, so this is not black brown, or throw some on some of the robes. We're just basically just fucking around, right? Just trying to block them in as we go, using the limited color palette for sustainability. What you're seeing here is a ghetto wet blend. I threw down some really thick wet brown, then I threw some really wet, thick green into it, swirled it together. 
Now that these, since these pipes on his chest are such focal points, I'm taking some pure magenta now and I'm isolating some of these details, just throwing some extreme highlights down on them. We already married up to this coat and now we're using pure magenta, right? I'm gonna use a little bit, maybe bright warm gray at some point, gonna go a step beyond and just make them look their best, right? Cause when you look at this guy, you really see what's going on on his chest. So you want it to be amazing. Even though we're gonna use washes and other techniques, you want to, you know, make a couple of shortcuts that like have the person who's looking at your model still appreciate it. This is one of those. Paying attention to these pipes, carve it in some nice crisp lines, people are gonna notice. Okay, now what I'm doing here is shifting this ball sack that's hanging from his backpack to a green. What I did was I really wetted the paint up, which lowers the opacity. If you wet the shit out of your paint, it really thins it down. But if you leave all that water on your brush, it's kind of a shitty wash. So you've seen me dab my brush on my paper on my desk. That's kind of like in a, in a pinch, removing a bunch of the excess moisture so I can still paint it on the model, leave it where I want, but still have it stay transparent. And since these are colors, this warm gray and this green are colors already in the model, they really just kind of want to stick to themselves. I'm getting great stick here with water thin paint, okay? We'll go into detail and glazing, blazing, lazy glazing and wet blending in a future video, but I use them all the time while building up my colors. So here we go. We're just in different states of completion here. We're working our way up to the next step. Now that we've gotten the airbrush transitions looking nice, we're gonna use some wash technique. Now the wash technique is about contrast, okay? What we're looking for is the dark things to be darker. Look, I'm not a scientist. I just know when you throw down a wash, it finds its way into the recesses, settles there, dries opaque, and pops that model. But here's the thing. To do it fast, you have to put it on the whole model, which will filter all these cool transitions and kind of deteriorate them. So if that's gonna happen, let's make it work for us with a system I call active washing. You guys know it. The Army Painter makes the best washes in the game today. I still use them for almost every project. So what I'm doing is I'm picking a three piece. We're gonna take a green, a brown, and a black. So I'm using Military Shader, Dark Tone, and Mid Brown. So I'm basically creating a, like the same workup we already did, right? The green is there to tie it together, to bring out the greens in our paint job that are getting hard to see. I'm just using a little bit of Vallejo Flow Improver, guys, to thin it down, stat easy. The trick here is to go hard as fuck. I've got a little Flow Improver in the mix. I try to keep a little clean pile of Flow Improver and I go real heavy with the wash. And then what I use is the lightest brush pressure possible. Once I start laying down an area, I try to finish it. I'm letting gravity pull the wash straight down toward his details. I'm manipulating the filtering by pulling the excess wash away from a flat area that I don't necessarily want it to exist and coaxing it into the recesses in real time. Sometimes to do this, what I do is fully wipe the brush down, reshape the, t uh, the tip and treat it as a sponge. Sometimes to achieve this, what I do is I dip for a little bit more flow improver, lightly put it on the area, use very small dabbing motions and light pressure to manipulate it to spread out a little bit more and maybe blend in. You are on a timer once you begin though. Okay, so you wanna kind of finish a region, work the wet angles and kind of lock it in. I'm doing this leg, I'm just gonna to try to finish the leg, working my way over to the nut curtain, try to finish that. You see it's pulling the wash down and what I'm doing is cleaning it up, not letting it ride and create these huge oceans of stain. There's gonna be zero coffee stains on this model. Lay it on thick, manipulate it. Don't be afraid to use a little bit more moisture. Don't be afraid to dry the brush off and use it as a sponge. Try to go as fast as you can, go as hard as you can. And then as long as you're actively engaged in this process, and you're working with a degree of intent, you will get stunning results from this. In a perfect world, all you gotta do is hit this wash. These shits are battle ready, looking better than most armies. But obviously, this is a three-piece system. The curriculum calls for more contrast. The whole purpose here is to make all these darker details even darker while preserving the cleanliness of our transitions. The filtering that is occurring is because of that military shader green. So our extra green is coming from that wash. It's kind of clinging to the green built into our workup from the airbrush. And it's gonna bring out some of that green and make it look beautiful. So now I'm just doing some 
detail work, kind of dialing it in, making sure some of my wash is residing in some details that I want it to. And you can see I'm using black now for the weapons. We switch straight to black wash and we're just gonna do raw dog black, keeping it kind of gangster, using the same technique, but maybe a little bit more rough around the edges. I'm okay with a little bit of staining on these weapons, because I mean, you could always use a dry brush method, but I'm gonna be doing some highlighting anyway, and maybe some oxidization later. So what I like to do is address the trim. I like to let some of the black wash kind of like linger on the trim, but maybe in the area between the trim and the shoulder, just trying to create shadows, trying to strengthen everything in the dark. That's the whole point of this wash step. Active washing. So now you can see our identical guys. One guy washed, one guy not. Looking beautiful. If washing is about making the dark things darker, then edge highlighting is about making the bright things brighter. See, we're going to double down, okay? We're going to find all the little angles, all the edges, and we're going to slap some crisp lines on them and make it pop. The next level painting and edge highlight system relies on two different brush strokes. One where we just pull it to our heart, when we move it left and right. I'm not gonna go into crazy detail in this video, but just remember this. If you're making a windshield wiper motion, it's probably gonna look like shit. Here we go. First step is the tracer. This is the moving left to right using the flat of the brush, okay? Just always say to yourself, hold your breath swinging from right to left. Move the model. Always take a second to reorient. Find something comfortable lay your hands on the desk and stay stable. The most uh, annoying part of this process is reloading the brush. I like to use a very small synthetic brush that doesn't hold a lot of moisture. Because of that, you're gonna have to load it up constantly. Biggest advice I can give you here is don't fight it. If you're creating your God power gravity well, well around you and you're really trying to make your brush weightless, if it's not transferring the paint, stop, reload the brush, Memorize the feeling of the consistency, and the consistency is very important. I like my paint to be pretty much raw dog out the pot, maybe a tiny bit of water or flow improver, just on the tip. I don't try to mix my paint up on the wet palette all wet. I want it pretty close to out of the pot. Now, sometimes what you're seeing me do here is use the very tip of my brush. And when I use the very tip of my brush, I try to hold the model in such a way where I'm pulling the line back. When I use the side of the brush like I just did there, I try to skirt an edge with the flat side and keep it straight. So basically it's a series of straight lines. And even if something is curved, you can achieve that curve. Here we go, using the tip of our brush, using the tip of our brush on these little holes. It's, a lot, it's actually a lot easier than you think because you can kind of fuck up a little bit, right? As we do these under highlights, but anything else that needs to be razor sharp, I'm using the tip of my brush, pulling it back toward my heart, trying to create nice, strong lines. The second I have to fight the brush and it's not deploying or transferring, I reload, keep going. I always take a test swipe on the cardboard, on the construction paper, whatever. See, reposition, come straight down. Reposition, come straight down. Try to make certain straight little lines. Now, sometimes you can get away with making a windshield wiper motion. But I'd say while you're learning to be fast and proficient and crisp with this technique, always take that second to move the model. Using the flat of your brush to catch anything that's closely resembling a 90 degree plane, using the very tip of your brush when you have to basically freehand a fucking straight line on something, right? Anytime you got an edge highlight and you don't have like some border or some crisp angle to like guide you, you're basically freehanding. So basically, do it as a straight line, pull it straight to you, clear the path, stay stable, and you will get it done. Now, during this process, I've been using the perfect rack the entire time. I've got two different size grips. This is my big fat grip right here. It's a little shorter. I like this. I like a nice round, like kind of wide girth to put in my hand, right? I feel like it keeps me more stable. So you heard it here first. I like a girthier grip in my hand when painting. So same deal, I'm gonna flip the model entirely upside down, okay? We're gonna do a combination of tracers and heart pulls. Hold your breath swinging from right to left. Pull it back to your heart. We're just creating some nice striations that exist subtly in the sculpt of this Plague Knight from Spellcrow, making the magic happen. Straight heart pulls right here on some of these chinks in the armor. Move back around. We're just investigating, okay? Now you can cut as many corners as you want. On a traditional Space Marine, you can get away with like 10 of these lines. 
But since these are Plague Marine, sort of counts as models, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of texture in the armor. And I wanna bring that texture out. So I'm gonna be spending a lot of time on this step, okay? This might take me straight 25 minutes a model, okay? This is gonna be the longest step, no lie. The airbrushing was super fucking fast. The washing was super fucking fast. The, this step takes every bit as long as the blocking and the detail stage. But this is where a lot of that final beauty, a lot of that final contrast comes from. Now, when you talk about contrast, guys, what you're looking for is bright things being bright and dark things being dark. And then the middle of the real estate, that's called the midtone. That's typically the color you imagine a model is, right? If it's blue, you might see some dark blue and some bright blue at the points, but it's mostly blue in the middle. What I typically look for is drama. And drama is like the willingness to kind of exploit the real estate. A lot of times I let that like final bright piece be insanely bright over a small amount of real estate. And sometimes I let the shadows be very dark over a long amount of real estate. So if you just play with those concepts while you're trying to deliver contrast on your models, just, you know, authorize yourself to be a little wacky, a little extreme, go hard. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is value-based contrast, right? Basically, bright and dark now hues can add a lot of value here as well but not value as an art term like more like it's a valuable looking piece they bring something to the table so when i use like something like a purple and i offset it with something like a really bright green those are not really about values as much as they are about complementing colors basic color matching right i like to pick colors that support contrast and i really go hard on my values and really extreme some of these lines on this model and his head on his chest they're getting kind of aggressive right some people might not go that hard i'm using basically pure bright warm gray but remember earlier when i say it's good to color combine a good rule of thumb if you don't know or you're not comfortable yet doing some hard edge highlighting on your model is whatever the last highlight you did in your airbrush was, sometimes it's just smart to pick that same color combination up and make that your first edge highlight. That'll usually guide your hand, lower the fail rate. Now we're gonna jump into the metal, our ghetto ass deathless metal. I'm gonna use some of that white gold from earlier, gonna kinda mix it in with some of the slurry from the original mix. And I'm just gonna really aggressively use some tracing technique. I'm gonna use some heart pulls when necessary, but I'm really just gonna pop out some of these edges on these corrupted bolter, corrupted plague knife. You could just do a quick dry brush if you wanted to, and you should master dry brushing and you should use it as often as you're comfortable with. But typically for me, I use dry brushing for like chain mail, dirt, some fur, and metal in some cases. My vision for this model is a little bit more pitted, a little bit more aggressive, and a little bit less dusty. So I'm going with a strong edge highlight. Now there's other things on this bolter that I discovered while edge highlighting it. So I'm gonna take my little edge highlight brush, just thin down some of that green we've been using, and I'm gonna do a real thin coat on some of these little corruption points. You know, and by being so wet, so moist, I've lowered the opacity. You see me dabbing the brush, trying to remove some of the water and we're basically painting with semi-transparent green. It's gonna take on the qualities of what's underneath it. It's kind of like it's a, a window, and the window has a little bit of green in it. You can see right through the window, but shit's a little green, right? Now, if you put 100 of that same window in front of you, eventually you won't be able to see through the windows and be opaque. So I'm typically never opaque. That's kind of like my rule of thumb as I'm building up colors. I'm trying to work my way up to opacity with this method. Now. There's a time and place to be opaque. You know, I do, I try to get really opaque with my edge highlights, but this is kind of a ghetto lazy glaze. Call it juicing if you want. You're basically making a glaze a wash and just running it in raw dog like this. It doesn't matter, right? Cause there's a lot going on there. So it can be a little messy. Since I'm playing with the green, that's inspired me to go and edge highlight our nut curtain. So I'm gonna use maybe some of the bright warm gray, use some of that bright yellow green. And I'm gonna use a little bit of heart pull technique, drag it straight down. I'm gonna use a little bit of the flat edge, tracer, hold your breast swinger from right to left. And any one of these lines that gets a little out of whack, if a line gets a little fat on you, a little shitty, just pretend it didn't. 
that's 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 how I solve that problem. So now what I'm doing is I'm gonna cut the eyes in with that pure bright warm gray. One and done. And that's kind of a ghetto pre-highlight. Okay. We're gonna come back to that. I've upgraded to my number four paintbrush because it's vastly superior glazing, and we are showing you a quick little glaze section 101.1. We're doing everything I said, lowering the opacity of the paint by watering it down. We're using a paper towel to remove the excess moisture. And this big number four is gonna let me basically dryly paint this transparent color on, right? Cause it's kind of like the, like a, a, an aspect of dry brushing, right? Where you're trying to remove the medium from the pigment and then dry brush it on a model. What I'm doing is lowering the opacity of a pigment, removing all the moisture. And then I'm using a series of dabbing motions, stabbing motions and light brush pressure to shift the hue okay let's accelerate we've got a little bit of that bright warm gray ancient technique here we're going to thin it down use a little pale green we're going to introduce maybe some greens some jades you can make a verdigris or patina effect from just about anything so green just basically pale green okay and go ultra thin this is juicing right here we have made a glaze but we're not removing as much moisture as we were before. We're treating this transparent glaze as a wash, but we're still controlling the deployment of the wash, letting it find its way into crevices where two pieces of metal touch. It's gonna dry patchy, it's gonna try super fucking shitty, but that's gonna really make the oxide effect look good, right? The same thing goes with rust. If you wanna do some oranges and browns, same technique. Don't wash the whole model, just find the areas you like. All right, I told you P3 might come up again. Blazing ink. This ink has basically informed so much of this paint job. When I saw this orange and how I could just lay this ink right over his pre-highlighted eye and get this nice little like orangey lens, it's actually what kind of convinced me later when I started doing the characters that secondary colors would introduce a blazing orange effect and because of that orange, now that kind of authorizes me to complement that orange with maybe a blue. So you're gonna see other features in my characters start shifting to those two colors. But for now, all of our Death Guard models right here are totally not Nurgle Plague Marines, I mean. Our Plague Knights are pretty much one and done. Now that model, he's still there. He hasn't been wet blended yet. He actually has, you'll see him here in a minute. They're looking good, they're ready. We gotta go through, do them all, and we will. And I have. This is Gamer's Grass Battle Ready Basis. Okay, this video took me a little while to make because I was waiting on these, COVID-19. So hopefully in the future, if you're watching this video, you'll know this video was made during a worldwide pandemic. I was able to paint these two models in the interim. These are some of those characters I was talking about and some of those colors. This is the guy who didn't get painted in this video, but he got web blended. And there is a video coming out about him too. And the web blending is the Next Level Painting 102 system. So what I'm gonna do is show you how on a project like this, Battle Ready Bases changed the game. This is my first project in ninth edition, and I wanna be able to expand infinitely. So by getting the Battle Ready Bases, I know all future expansions of this army will have a sick base that matches. They're a little pricey, but worth it especially if you're batch painting entire armies or you're specifically your commissioned painter. Strongly recommend getting on their website, convincing your client to go with these bases. They come out of the box like this. What I like to do for models like this that only have one point of contact, one foot, is I take my pin vise, drill a little fucking hole in his foot, drill a little fucking hole in the base. I already have a paper clip that matches that drill bit. I take a little super glue. I like to pile up my super glue somewhere else that I could just dip into it. And I'm gonna glue this little piece of paper clip, very small, into the bottom of this dude's foot. Now, you don't have to pin all your guys to battle ready bases, okay? Most of their bases have a lot more grass on it than these. And, and I'll show you how easy it is to actually glue these guys to the grass. But I'm gonna be putting these guys, taking them to trade shows. They're gonna be inside of cases, transported. I just don't want them to snap off their bases and I don't have as much grass to stick to here. So we're gonna be pinning anybody who has a fail rate to their base. Doesn't take very long, as you can see. Pretty, pretty simple, okay. So I'm gonna show you in real time. Fast forwarded, I'm doing all this today. Gluing them on. Now here's an example of a grass tuft. I could actually reach this tuft. So all you gotta do is glue 
the dude up and jam one of his feet into that tuft of grass. That motherfucker is never coming off that grass. When that glue dries, it's created like a fiber mesh network. And sometimes it may feel like he's going to come off the model, but he is there for life. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is use some Thalmor Black. This is P3 formula as well. This is like one of the blackest blacks in the game. And I try to go out the pot raw dog, very little moisture, and I like to paint all my rims black because in my opinion, they sharpen the model. I have a lot of hot take opinions on this. And you can see on these battle ready bases, some of the uh, overhangs aren't really painted. I'm gonna go back in and maybe adjust those, give them a little bit of love, give them a little bit of texture. But for as far as battle ready purposes goes, all I recommend doing is maybe finding a couple uh, you know, mold angles that have like a little bit of a uh, overhang, scrape them, very little excess work needs to be done here. Just paint those rims of your base black. And this is the uh, Urban Warzone base series. It's gonna be featured in my entire Death Guard army throughout ninth edition. We've got more videos in the pipe for you guys. We're going hard. As always, thank you for kicking it with me today. And play on, players. If you like these tutorials, check out Next Level Painting on Patreon. Become a patron of the arts today. We offer early and exclusive access to our videos and a rewards program for different pledge levels. Patreon is PayPal and credit card secure, so you don't have to worry about that. We use 100% of the money to improve our process.